Thank you for being prompt and coming right back in on time. We are going to start uh, right now at 3.30. Uh, just uh, an announcement to make sure you're clear. Uh, I think Corrine made it clear initially. Our speaker that was supposed to be today at this time is having travel issues and so is not here yet. And we'll actually be speaking tomorrow morning at 10.15. So our present speaker graciously said, sure, we'll just switch. And so I will speak now. So our speaker at this point is Dr. Esther Chung Kim. She is an associate professor of religious studies at Claremont McKenna College. She specializes in the history of world Christianity, including the European Reformation, and also teaches seminars on poverty, wealth, and social change, European Reformations, and Christianity and politics in East Asia. Her most recent article is titled Aid for Refugees, Religion, Migration, and Poor Relief in 16th Century Geneva and is published by Reformation and Renaissance Review. It was done in 2018. So we welcome Esther to the podium, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. So we heard quite a bit about Zwingli not too long ago, and one of the reactions to Zwingli was that his successor, Heinrich Bullinger, was to, um, he was prohibited from any political preaching. But as you see from my title, that is going to shift a little. Uh, so Bullinger actually responded to the council's specific mandate of no political preaching by trying to preserve the prophetic role of the preacher. So here was their compromise. Their compromise was that if Bullinger had any political criticism, it would be done in private, but not in public. So in a report to the Zurich City Council in the fall of 1540, Heinrich Bullinger wrote that the city enjoyed unprecedented prosperity, but at the same time, he urged the council to plan ahead for possible difficult times to come. Just have a picture here. He had a very long tenure in Zurich, so I have a picture of him as the young Bullinger, and here as the mature Bullinger, and that's a picture of his wife. Within a few years of this uh, comment that he said, signs of economic stress began to overwhelm the city's poor relief system. The rapidly increasing number of beggars, in particular, led to the re-examination of poor relief policies. By January 1544, it was necessary to revise the alms order of 1525 for the first time. So this alms order that was put in place in 1525 was roughly continuing for the lot, roughly 20 years. This first major change revealed that the number of poor people had increased dramatically because the records indicated that one pot of grain porridge was no longer enough but now had to be doubled to two pots to feed the hungry. The initial response from the council was to limit aid to those designated as worthy poor. The council's intention was to divide the beggars into three groups according to their origin, whether from abroad, within the Swiss Confederation, or within their own territory, so that they could be supported differently. At this time, the council also renewed an earlier ban from 1533, limiting the accommodation for foreigners to no more than eight days. As the poor relief system proved to be inefficient for the growing need, ministers became more concerned about the political affairs concerning poor relief policy. Starting in the 1550s, Bullinger, as chief minister, began to increasingly address this vexing social problem of poverty. Although Bullinger himself was the chief minister at this time, his collaboration with other ministers was noticeable in his speeches and usually represented multiple pastors. In his vision for reforming Zurich, Bullinger hoped that he and all his colleagues would serve 
as a collective episcopacy, a term um, termed by uh, J.D. Wood, specifically working together as a faithful and prudent servant. On March 7, 1551, Bullinger articulated his critical perspective on the situation before the small council. Informed by his study of scripture, his years of preaching and pastoral experience, and the anxieties of social crises, Bullinger entered the area of social policy reform. In part, the transition from sermons to speeches was a matter of audience. Bullinger's political speeches signaled the effort of the chief minister to persuade the political decisions of the council. If you look at his speeches in the 1550s and again in the 1570s, Bullinger highlighted his concerns for an effective poor relief policies in four ways. Now, I'm going to list all four, but I'm going to talk about them in succession. So one, by calling for the right use of church property. Second, by criticizing the moral turpitude that consumed precious resources. Third, by advocating for the outlaw of able-bodied begging. And four, by proposing job creation programs that were funded by the city. So the first two concerns reiterated themes that were previously raised in his sermons, while the latter two concerns revealed a development in his practical proposals. So first, Bullinger and his fellow ministers disparaged what they saw as a misguided policy regarding church property. The city ministers reminded the politicians of the promises of the Reformation, which taught that the goods that had been, that formerly served the superstition and the church of splendor should now be awarded to the living saintly poor. Tensions over the use of former church property, be, church property became apparent in December 1555. At that time, a conflict erupted over a pastor's political preaching criticizing the city council's choices. This time, it was the minister of Tos, Rudolf Husli, who was imprisoned in Zurich because he had criticized the council's use of church property in a sermon. Husley was released after two days of detention, but defrocked. On December 16, 1555, Bullinger, accompanied by the city's pastors, came before the council to complain about the handling of this case. He protested not only the degrading treatment of this pastor, but spoke more generally about the use or the proper use of church property. In his speech, Bullinger made it clear that church property should be used partly for supporting pastors and their households, partly for maintaining church buildings, partly for educating students, and partly for caring for the poor. His message was clear that magistrates should not devise other plans for these types of resources, which were given and dedicated for these ministerial purposes. Second, Another theme that comes up both in his sermons and speeches, Bullinger expressed his concern for moral problems related to begging and poverty. Many people had fallen into begging because of their poor choices. Hence, Bullinger argued for the reinforcement or the enforcement of moral mandates. Excessive gorging, drinking and gambling were signs of visible visible consumption that led many people without reserves into poverty. Since conspicuous consumption led to impoverishment, this social problem was treated as a moral deficiency associated with wrongful behavior. Even into the 1570s, you hear Bullinger, along with Rudolf Gualther, later Bullinger's successor, continue to deride moral corruption as one of the root causes of societal problems. For example, in their private report to the Special Commission, in September of 1572, they chided the increase of taverns because they believed that such businesses added to misery, poverty, and begging. Third, um, oh, let me go back one slide. This is a picture of a medieval monastery in the former Swiss city of Tos, which is now kind of lumped together with the city of uh, Winterthur. But 
basically during the Reformation, this monastery would have been closed down and its resources used for the poor. That was the most common use of church property or confiscated church property. Third, in response to this increase in beggars, Bullinger blamed able-bodied beggars for exacerbating the socioeconomic dilemma of poverty and disorder. Disturbed by those who would take resources needed for the destitute, Bullinger observed, quote, many people who are healthy and fit for work were begging because the begging profession had become more profitable than working. In light of limited resources and growing need, Bullinger believed that reducing the number of able-bodied beggars would ultimately lead to the alleviation of poverty itself. Although Bullinger, accompanied by Gualther and Lavater, Bullinger's son-in-law and later Gualther's successor, made a speech compelling the council to take action as early as 1551, the council still maintained a relatively passive role in combating poverty. The council's treasurer, Jakob Wedmuller, encouraged the council to set up a business to give work to the poor. But this entrepreneurial initiative remained in private hands since the council was only indirectly involved through tax rebates. The council's ambivalence about the responsibility for poor relief over centralization versus decentralization was evident in their vacillation between prohibition and permission of begging whenever demands on the resources became too great. Nevertheless, both ministers and politicians shared a sense of responsibility for resolving the economic strain of poverty. On March 23, 1558, Bullinger initiated an improvised working collaboration with council members. Along with six other ministers, he appeared before the council to bring forth a new measure concerning poverty alleviation. He prefaced this proposal with a justification for ministers' engagement in the affairs of social policy by drawing on biblical mandates as well as historical examples. He used multiple passages in Romans, Corinthians, Deuteronomy, Acts, 1 Timothy, Matthew, and 1 John. And he justified ministers getting involved in political matters by arguing that the case of the poor is a case for all Christians, especially the servants of the church. He included specific examples of the early apostles in Acts who took on the work of caring for the poor and gave historical examples of clergy who were in charge of almsgiving since the beginning of the church. Therefore, Bullinger surmised that because servants of the church had hitherto played a pivotal role in poor relief, ministers could establish themselves as rightful authorities on this matter. Also, from a legal standpoint, the ministers had a right to monitor the alms accounts and the administration of local church property as a measure of accountability. In response to the organized impetus from the ministers, the council immediately formed a commission to treat these proposals and findings. Like many of his contemporaries, Bullinger distinguished between those who were truly poor because they could not work or earn enough wages and those who opted for the beggar's profession. This difference explains why Bullinger sometimes sounded supportive of the poor while deeply critical of them as well. While Bullinger defended the support of the former, he strongly opposed the latter because he saw begging as diverting resources that should be earmarked for the truly poor. Recognizing the growing trend of economic hardships as the number of poor people doubled and then tripled in the span of a few years, Bullinger outlined his strategic plan. Simply put, the strong and healthy beggars would be prohibited from begging, In contrast, the truly needy would be well cared for. Bullinger argued that since begging promoted disruptive, harmful acts as well as destructive protests, those who chose begging over another profession would not qualify for relief. His disdain for begging grew out of his regular observations in the city that beggars seemed to waste their money. He observed, quote, with whatever amount they have begged in the morning, They sit in the streets and cellars and drink. They linger in places where they can get wine. 
instead of bringing the money home to their children where it could help them. So you see them all around the city and the monasteries. They lay everywhere, having spent all their money. As Bullinger saw it, beggars did not live under the discipline or the governance of a guild or a profession, but instead did whatever they wanted and even taught their children to beg. Concerning the burgeoning number of able-bodied beggars, he urged the council to take action. Bullinger told the council, first of all, to prohibit begging, and second, to help the truly poor, so, so that there would be no need for begging. Whenever the council allowed begging, it allowed for unruly behaviors which threatened peaceful order and social stability. While his commentaries focused primarily on his theological reasons for poor relief, Bullinger's sermons bridged theology and social concerns as he exhorted listeners to ethical behavior. Then his speeches moved from the practical applications in his sermons to pastoral advocacy for the poor before the council. Foundational religious values learned from the Bible, plus years of experiential knowledge of poor parishioners, and what he considered the council's failure to remedy the needs of the poor, empowered Bullinger to call for poor relief reform. Before the magistrates, he pinpointed political, economic, and social benefits of poor relief programs. He declared, when you help the truly poor, things remain peaceful and orderly, with the added benefit that negative views and criticisms against the magistrates likewise diminish. Effective poor relief would improve public opinion on city governance. In the last part of his 1558 speech, Bullinger did not forego criticizing, once again, the wrongful use of church property. In particular, he noted the failure to use church funds for its intended purposes, that, and doing the so had resulted in pathetic outcomes. The city had used the money to buy weapons, manufacture ammunition, and pay for the war. So Bullinger remarked that such spending did not bring much success since church goods were meant for the poor, not for funding wars. A month later, in, in April 1558, the ministers submitted 10 action points to the special commission formed by the council. Collaboration among the ministers produced a shift in these April proposals. In the previous March proposals, the focus was on the standard that able-bodied beggars should work and the truly poor support it. This is a continuous mantra you hear over and over again. But in the April measures, specific changes demonstrated an effort to make way for all the poor to be productive. In their concerns about poverty alleviation, they addressed the problems of employment, debt, inflation, and the need for preventative measures. The ministers asserted, <clears throat> quote, because the poor is not a small number, it is highly necessary to see how to provide the poor with labor so they can work and earn a living. Whether it be through fabric making or whatever else they can produce, something that would be approved as desirable and useful, but not too demanding to make, we have some experience with the trade of cloth making, spinning yarn, and making heavy fabric to know how many, how many people can be supported with this. As we already know, yarn weaving now provides for the young and old in Winterthur. Bullinger also argued that the city council should prohibit the unseemly tug of suspicious loans that cause rural residents to take out loans and as a result go into debt. He wrote, your honors should not allow people to travel to another region to make money and bring it back, which they then loan to the farmers. Then the land is pawned to the loaner and if the loan is not repaid, the land never goes back to the struggling poor people. This debt is the main cause of their downfall. He advocated for government intervention in economic policies that preyed on vulnerable working poor. Such predator, predatory economic behavior would eventually result in the ownership of these lands accumulating into a few hands, including outsiders beyond the city. 
Bullinger also called for state intervention in matters of price regulation, particularly for food supplies such as corn and grain. He derided the speculation of high food prices and petitioned the state to open up its stores of grain whenever the prices skyrocketed. The minister's proposal illustrated their development into agents for social change from focusing solely on moral deficiency and criticism of mismanagement now to practical suggestions for poverty reduction and prevention. According to Bullinger's diaries, climate change also inaugurated a new period of hardships. I have a picture here of a flood in the uh, Magia Valley, which is in the southern part of Switzerland. With floods, crop failures, harsh winters, especially in 1570, inflation and the lack of food resulted in a growing number of beggars. In 1571, Bullinger noted that many would surely die of hunger because of a limited harvest, and he prayed for divine mercy. In such dire circumstances, he also called for councilmen to join in congregational prayers. A drawing on the cover of Johannes Jakob Wick's collection depicted the hard winter of 1570 and 1571 with images of a frozen Zurich lake and people falling through the ice. Meanwhile, ravenous wolves attack and killed three seamstresses, which is also depicted in this drawing. Like many others, Bullinger interpreted this small ice age as a punishment from God and therefore called on believers to pray and live a moral life. Because many perceived the relentless calamities as divine judgment, the council ordered the introduction of a congregational prayer composed by Bullinger for this state of emergency. At this time, Bullinger's prayer focused on the plea for mercy against a comprehensive range of afflictions, including inflation, hunger, bad climate, war, and sickness. Faced with mass poverty, he called for special prayer meetings to seek divine intervention in response to this tragedy. Bullinger saw poverty as a miserable problem that slyly found new reasons to arise. Prompted by the food crisis caused by the colder climate, the ministers and magistrates reviewed policies and revised practices as they continued to seek remedies. The council tried to manage the seriousness of the situation by appointing a new commission to discuss further measures concerning poor relief. However, their discussion did not amount to much change. When a certain helplessness regarding how to proceed arose, a council member approached Bullinger to ask for his advice. This reveals a gradual change from the council's earlier attitude towards ministers. Now the council, driven by the desperate winter of 1570 and 71, turned to their long-standing chief minister for guidance. Bullinger shifted the target, at this time when he's asked for his advice, Bullinger shifts his target of his criticism from the immoral poor to the immoral rich. So he begins to now criticize the weak leadership of the magistrates and the upper class. This time, Bullinger was concerned with the poor example of leadership and complained that the upper class lifestyle had incited God's wrath. This is a shift. Up to this point, much of the attention of poor relief had focused on the poor themselves. Now the ministers noticed the wealthy and their consumptive behaviors. The ministers believed that better discipline would contribute to economic and social stability. And they directed this type of moral disciplining not only at able-bodied beggars, but at civic leaders whose unethical practices re resulted in the depletion of funds. In particular, in May, on May 13, 1572, Bullinger addressed the suspicions against the Alms Administration Office for economic exploitation by its director, Stoltz. In a time when economic distress was high and poverty threatened the survival of many people, the apparent wealth and opulence of the Alms Office director seemed puzzling. Bullinger allegation, Bullinger's allegations originated from the enigmatic enrichment 
of the former shoemaker, who in his first year as alms director purchased personal goods costing 700 to 900 pounds, although previously he, has, he had lacked assets. Suddenly, he could afford to go to Constance to buy expensive leather, which was then processed by his companions. But earlier, he had barely been able to pay the tanners in Zurich. Since his new position as the alms administrator, he led a complex and costly household. Upon further examination into these allegations, the large council on June 11, 1572, instructed the wardens to make clear to the director that he must keep his private business separate from the alms administration. And he ought not to entertain or utilize employees from that office for his personal business. Otherwise, he must resign the office. The verification of this misappropriation of alms fund served as an egregious example fueling the minister's critique about the misuse of church funds by secular magistrates. On August 20th, 1572, the ministers came again before the large council because of the increasing social and economic hardships within their communities to reiterate their concern for misery and moral de decay and asking a new commission to sift through and consider the best policies addressing poverty. In the following weeks, Bullinger worked on a report which he presented to the commissions that began to renew and update older mandates. In addition, Bullinger and Gualther, in a private report to the commission, suggested specific proposals, such as providing raw materials, employing the poor, supporting businesses, and buying finished products. Bullinger and Gualthers had increasingly drawn the attention of the magistrates towards this type of assistance. The magistrates had started some efforts toward creating work, but the pastors continued to put pressure on the councils to promote this type of work program. Now, you'll remember that years earlier, in 1558, the pastors had already indicated for the first time the way to combat poverty was to find a way for the poor to earn a living. And they're coming back to these proposals with more specificity by the, by the early 1570s. Bullinger and Gualthers focused linking poverty alleviation with employment. Their proposals offered suggestions for new job opportunities. They were innovated not in the sense that no one had ever heard of such employment initiatives, but they were innovative in the sense that these, initi these initiatives or these types of initiatives had not been actively pursued as part of a government-sponsored poor relief program in Zurich. Besides the familiar demands for a strict ban on begging, careful review of individual arms, alms, and a crackdown on vices, Bullinger and Gualther highlighted a distinctive proposal to organize a government-supported program that simultaneously provided salaries for women and children, work for poor weavers, clothing for students, and creating a system in which they would all kind of support each other. So I know these photos of these paintings and this woodcut are from a later period, but I'm trying to illustrate the notion of work. So in their proposal for combating poverty and begging, they wrote, quote, the women and children should receive working materials to spin and some bread from the city. They would deliver the yarn at a specific specific time and receive a cash salary as well as new material for processing. The yarn then should be given to the poor weavers in the city and in the countryside. The final product, linen and twill, would annually provide sturdy clothes to the cloisters and hospitals for the orphans, the apprentice boys, and others so that one could save those costs. The city should then sell any remaining cloth so that the profit that remains will be used to buy other raw materials. Gradually, one could introduce the wool industry together with the silk industry, which would then serve as businesses for men and women, young and old. This was their proposal. 
The collective experience of pastors helped them realize the link between the causes of poverty and un- unemployment. While most people tried to deal with poverty through ad hoc individual arrangements, Bullinger, along with other ministers, sought to establish a system of poverty alleviation. After years of advocating for the needs of the poor, the pastor's proposal signaled the beginning of examining the cause of poverty as a way to combat it. On September 4, 1572, Bullinger introduced an expansive program that would give poor but able men, women, and children access to employment and earnings in the textile industries and provide vocational training for boys to, in order to relieve the alms demand. Bullinger and Gualthers also brought into consideration road building as a form of temporary work. They suggested the building of workhouses for offenders since able-bodied criminals should not simply be locked up, but rather given some kind of work, such as repairing crumbling roads and buildings. While many of these measures focused on problems in the city, they also did give attention to the surrounding rural areas of Zurich. Concerned for the misuse of church resources in the countryside, Bullinger promoted the recording of accounts. He uh, argued that magistrates in the countryside added excessive expenditures to church expenses by employing those who were not needed, yet had to be paid and entertained. He also wished that the rural governors would stop augmenting their salaries with additional withdrawals from the church account, which They did not do at the start of the Reformation, but they were now doing. In this 1572 proposal, the ministers suggested another major change in poor relief policy. Bullinger and Gualthers called for the rethinking of the monthly or bi-monthly distribution from the donations collected from the city churches. First, They argued that the regularly scheduled distribution from the church offerings had caused many poor people from all over the countryside to flock to the city to receive the regular monthly handout, thereby overwhelming city resources, including the hospital. Second, Bullinger saw that poor people wasted their money by squandering most of it in the city or by spending it on drinking so that so very little of the money actually reached the countryside. In response, the commission decided that donation money collected from the churches would no longer be distributed regularly, but rather be used sparingly and dispensed only for reasonable requests. This change in policy from regular distribution of handouts to selective distribution by specific request disclosed an ongoing effort to channel financial aid to the deserving poor and a greater intentionality to reduce dependence whenever possible. In his last years, uh, despite his growing pessimism, Bullinger continued to emphasize the importance of poor relief. In his farewell letter to the magistrates, he urged the counselors to attend the sermons and communal prayers more frequently as has been done so far by the majority of you. He also urged them to help the poor, the foreigners, the widows, the orphans, and graciously care for all the faithful preachers. For if you treat them badly and miserably, you will provoke the wrath of God upon yourself. Bullinger instructed the counselors to ensure that poor relief does not break down and to manage the hospital and poor houses without overcrowding them, to rightly use donated wealth for the truly poor school and support of the church so that God will be honored with it. For Bullinger, these instructions carried religious significance since those who took pity on the poor would receive mercy from God, while those who turned away from the poor would not have their prayers answered. In closing, his underlying rationale for continued attention to poor relief was a religious motivation, namely to be heard by God. Bullinger's religious instructions was a call to action to accelerate and consolidate a more effective program for poverty eradication. Thank you.
We now have time for questions. Please, uh, when you ask a question, just state your name, hold the mic toward the top. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Rebecca Hall. I'm a seminary student here. And um, I was struck by yours and uh, Dr. Bruce's, uh, Bruce Gorman's uh, statement about the reformers being prophetic voices. Mm -hmm. And um, in our era of separation of church and state, it seems very interesting. I was wondering what the 16th century understanding of the preacher's role of that prophetic voice in civil reform, um, either personal advocate or a prophet representing God or perhaps um, the corporate opinion of the church. What, is, what was that view? Yeah, so that's a good question because right now among scholars there's a big debate about that. There's quite a, a bit of literature that has come out pretty recently on uh, Bullinger as a prophet. And there's some disagreement actually about that particular question. But in general, the sense is they prefer the term pastor, but they use the word prophet when they are talking about the preaching office. And the sense is if God cares about it, pastors can preach on it. So that's a kind of a general sense. But then how do they actually use that? So do they mean prophetic in the sense in which I mean, I think the way they're mostly using the prophetic sense is to speak truth or to speak accurately about the situation, to interpret what is going on through, through scripture, but also how God might see it today. And so there is a sense in which the, even the prophetic voice is contextualized, right? It's within a context. And they do feel like God is speaking to them in their world and in their um, time. Uh, but the debate part is about how much of that prophetic voice is assumed. There might be others who can speak on it. I, I see a hand up there. Oh, I can't speak on oh, it. Oh, okay. I was wondering if you want to I add to question. that. Okay. Okay. Hi. I'm Jennifer McNett. Thank you, Esther, for your paper. Um, I'm at Wheaton College. Um, my question is about the diaconate. In fact, um, does the Zurich uh, Reformation see the restoration of the diaconate um, like we see in Geneva? And in fact, um, are women involved in the, the activity and leadership of that? Yeah, so uh, that's an interesting question, too. Um, I have just finished, actually, a, a book about history of poor relief, and I look at Lutheran tradition, reform tradition, the Swiss reform tradition, and then the Anabaptist tradition. And interestingly enough, the, the, the word deacon comes up regularly, although sometimes it's not as um, prominent, but it comes up regularly in, in, a, in all of the traditions. But the place I do kind of hear it the least used is actually in this tradition. I'm not sure why. I don't know if I just didn't come across it. There is, the concept of deacons is there, but I don't hear them actually referring to deacons very much. Uh, there's a lot more attention given to sort of the collective pastors, the ministers, and they do include all the city ministers from both the Zurich city and the countryside. Um, and my guess is that they clearly could not have done this work on their own. And in fact, in this, I don't know if this is uh, conjecture on the side of the movie maker or the director, but when I saw the Zwingli movie, the initial setting is you see women giving out food. They're the ones who actually are serving that pot of porridge. Um, but I was looking specifically at the political speeches they're ma uh, that Bullinger and the ministers are making to the councils to get them to act. So I'm not sure about the daily. My guess, if I were to just guess, I would guess they were involved. Uh, but they're not named, and so we're not sure. So um, an observation and a question. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to the term deacon, it does appear in Zurich, but when they say diakon, they mean something very different. They mean the first step to ministry, mm -hmm. right? They're talking about someone who's going to go in to be a pastor, like the Catholic model right. re-continuing. And, and the Swiss-German model 
saw that term, diakon, in a very specific way as part of the route mm -hmm. to pastor. So it, it, it was different from the Genevan model, which revived the deacon concept as something very, very different. But there's a, there's a funny period of overlap there where no one's quite sure yeah. what it is a deacon actually does. He could be doing a lot of things, from teaching catechism to helping with poor relief. To It's almost like a multi-purpose job. I, I wrote an article on that. Um, and then my question. So in the Catholic world, care for the poor is a good deed, right? It'll, it'll help you reach salvation. It's something that helps you meritoriously on your way to salvation. In what ways did the Zurich reformers wrestle with the situation of trying to explain why caring for the poor is still important, even though it doesn't help you in that spiritual progress anymore if you move away from Catholic theology. Right, so this was actually a problem starting with the Lutherans. I mean, mm -hmm. it wasn't just a problem, I would say, specific to uh, the Swiss reform. So there's a couple of uh, strategies they use. So one is they take the route of uh, emphasis on community. So within a Christian community, uh, there is a sense in which you care for your, the love of neighbor is still a live and well living doctrine amongst them. So the, one of the approaches is to focus on community, right? But then it, then, as you heard a little bit in today's paper, how they define community will define who they're going to help, right? Um, another way that's uh, been approached is simply to just say that God still requires this of us. It's not related directly to salvation itself, but it is still something that God expects of believers who are living out the faith in the real world, and it's a good model, and then the third thing that actually is specific to Swiss Reform and Zurich in particular is one of the earliest criticisms against Protestants in, in, in the Swiss Confederation were that they didn't care for the poor. That they were, you know, the Catholics are the ones who took care of the poor. Look at the Protestants. They're not, you know, they're getting rid of all of the images. And as part of that, you know, there's obviously some who took these resources and didn't use them for poor relief. So there was this sense in which the Swiss reform initially were getting a bad reputation for not taking care of the poor. So then there was this sort of push to say, no, we do take care of the poor. Uh, and, and, it's an exam and here are examples where we're trying to do that. So there was an effort in some ways, they were playing a little bit of a catch up because the Catholics were using that as against them actually. Yeah. Esther, thank you for a great paper. Um, Scott Manich oh, you're there. Uh, okay. from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Could you say a little more about the poor houses and hospitals? Did they precede the Swiss Reformation, and did Zwingli have a role or a concern in those poor houses or those hospitals? So if you give us kind of a broader view of that history. Yeah, so uh, I think the way we think of poor houses definitely comes later. But I think the notion is, okay, I don't have up there now. Uh, the notion is that, well, hospitals are a little easier to begin with, right? Because hospitals are where people come to for any sort of care. And a lot of times they're filled with orphans um, or sometimes sick, aged, elderly. In the case of poor houses, they tend to be these um, places where a lot of apprentices are living, where you have people who they're trying to give work to and so they kind of pull them together. But, they're, right, but in the beginning, they're really not what we're thinking of. They're not like huge established places. They might be in someone's home or at a farm or things like that. Um, so I think that the, the establishment of poor houses really comes later. Um, I, don't, I don't know that Zwingli himself talks specifically about poor houses, but obviously there are places where poor gather. So uh, one of the things that Bullinger talks about is that they gather at the monasteries, right? They're, they're kind of congregating there or something like that. So you do get a sense that they're in certain places, but the full poorhouses thing comes later. So it's not with Zwingli. I, I don't, I, at least I didn't see it there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for your innovative approach and explanation. 
I'm glad you clarified that the Catholics also were concerned about poor relief. My impression of your paper is even better. It's not about poor relief as much as it's about wealth creation. Mm. And in that light, is there any reference, any discussions about the guilds, the guild system? Because it was beginning in opposition to the guilds which were restricting employment. Any reference in the literature there about the guilds and criticism of the guilds? I didn't notice it in the speeches to the council. Um, there are earlier speeches he makes about, you know, and this is a common thing among Reformation uh, thinkers. There is obviously clear uh, speeches against like um, usury or interest loans. And he does talk a little bit about, um, yeah, he does talk about job creation, but it's never actually in the guild section. He mostly talks about, he wants the, the city to promote these things because he thinks the city has the resources because it's the one who's taking the church resources. So, yeah, he doesn't actually address that. Um, although I will say when I was in Zurich uh, recently, one of the professors there decided to take us to dinner at one of these guild uh, houses. And first of all, it was very hard to get into because they're very exclusive. Um, he actually told us to wait in the street so we wouldn't be seen. Uh, so that he could be the one negotiating uh, our entrance. But when we did actually gain entrance to one of them, uh, one of the things that was very clear to me is they are very exclusive. So I don't know if Bullinger just thought that's probably not the best way it's going to work, although I'm sure a lot of them also did uh, donate. I mean, he did talk about generous giving and things like that. So I'm sure he expected them to be giving in some way. But he doesn't directly address it, at least from what I've read. There's a question here. Uh, Doug Kuyper is my name. Thank you yeah. for your speech. You referred to a prayer that uh, Bullinger drafted in 1571, a congregational prayer. And I've, there's a lot of Bullinger I haven't read. So my question is simply, is that prayer available in English? Um, is it available in English? My guess is that it is, parts of it are in English. I don't know if the full prayer is, but I think parts of it are in English. I'll have to, I would have to look that up to answer that accurately. Yeah. Um, Shirley Rules, I direct the International Network for Christian Higher Education. I thought at one point, and I just wanted to see if I understood you clearly, that in the 10 um, action points in 1558, the direct appeal is to the city to create jobs. But then I thought I heard you say that when they come back to this refinement of policy in 1572, uh, I thought I heard you say that there is some reference now here to employers who are not city officials. Uh, was Did I hear you say that? Be because I thought that's that's an interesting shift if they're also then starting to say there's a responsibility of the, the private non-city officials. Mm -hmm. But maybe I didn't hear you right about that. So let me, let me clarify uh, something. So when they make the proposal initially in the 1550s, the council doesn't act on it. Mm -hmm. But there are private people who do act on it. There are, they think that's a good idea. So the only way that the council is involved is indirectly right, through tax rebates. So that, that is there. I'm trying to think, in the later period, their proposal does include this sort of system, right, the, the, the people who spin, those who make the fabric, those who make the fabric then into clothing, who then clothe the, the kids and the orphans and the workers. So there is, you would think that in that system there would have to be some other people involved. Uh, but it's generated by the city purchasing raw materials, who then start that system. Yeah. So, that, so there isn't a particular appeal by anything that the ministers asked for in 1572 as an appeal to the city at that point. Right. That reflects a sense of a 
a private employer specifically. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Okay. If not, let us again thank you, our speaker. We now have time for a break, so enjoy that.